You're listening to Impulse to Innovation. The Institution of Mechanical Engineers podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Helen Mees. As a global community of mechanical engineers with over 120,000 members in 140 countries, the Institution of Mechanical Engineers has been at the heart of the engineering profession since 1847. The Institution's mission is to improve the world through engineering by sharing the latest news, views and insight into the creative world of technology and the people that make it happen. Our world is filled with structures, statues and artefacts that humankind has created. Throughout our history, we have utilised different materials, methodologies and technologies to help us innovate and construct ever more complex objects. But it is only in more recent decades that society has recognised the significance of these items and the responsibility it has to conserve and protect them for posterity. Across the world, many of these incredible technological and artistic objects have been safeguarded and restored by heritage specialists and artistic conservators. So why would we be talking about preservation and heritage on an engineering podcast? Well, believe it or not, the protection and recognition of our heritage, particularly those artefacts, locations and landmarks with links to engineering, have been the focus of the IMACI since the mid-1980s, with over 130 of them being celebrated through its Engineering Heritage Awards. We can, of course, consider our own Birdcage Walk building among these heritage places and objects of significance, as it too represents over 120 years of engineering tradition, yet is itself in need of significant maintenance to remain a useful part of the Amakee's legacy. But what exactly is the engineer's role in conservation? I have to admit, my first thought was building conservation, the protection of architectural relics, their structural stability and repair, like the recent work carried out on Big Ben in London, for example. And I had assumed, wrongly, that this would be the realm of civil engineers. But as it turns out, conservation engineering is a diverse, multidisciplinary profession drawing not just on the technical skills of the engineer, but on their creative and innovative talents to understand and protect all manner of objects, from artworks to engines. In this month's episode, I had the opportunity to speak with Ian Clark, Managing Director of Ian Clark Restorations and EngTech Fellow of the Institution. Ian is unreservedly passionate about the restoration and preservation of our historical and technological achievements, and it has been a part of his life for over 40 years. He has worked with the likes of English Heritage, the National Trust, and hundreds of national and international organisations, conserving firearms, statues, submarines, windmills, and everything in between. He has received numerous awards for his work and his advocacy of conservation engineering, and has played a leading role as a committee member of the Heritage Awards. Ian has so much enthusiasm and so many engaging anecdotes to share that we truly lost track of time, and so this is the first eye-to-eye two-part episode. In the first segment of the show, we talked about the field of conservation engineering, how it came to be a part of Ian's life and career, and what opportunities there are for engineers looking to join this small community. Ian, thank you for joining me today. I started today's podcast by describing briefly what conservation engineering is all about, but I'm no expert. So could you tell our listeners a little bit more about what a conservation engineer is and why conserving our industrial heritage is so important? Thank you, Helen. Yeah, um, I'd like to start with sort of really sort of contextualising that question, which is conservation engineer, I guess, is a term that maybe me and a few other people have sort of started to use in recent years. It's not a it's not a term that's widely used or actually accepted, which is um, quite strange. I mean, if you think like, it's not like, say, conservation architect or conservation bricklayer. Um, right. <laughs> th- these are terms that are used very regularly in, in, in the conservation world, the wider conservation world. Yeah. Um, and therein lies another challenge, which we'll probably touch on a bit later. So... 
conservation and engineering bring the two together. Um, I trained as a mechanical engineer, uh, and my love has always been working with, with industrial heritage, cultural heritage, old machines and, and the like. And for me, it was, a, it was a sort of natural progression, synergy between the love of, love of engineering and the love of, of sort of old engineering, bring the two together, and hence the term conservation engineering. And I think the reason we've started using this term is that mechanical engineering or engineering in a, in a wider sense is, is having, is had, has had to fight really hard to find a space in the wider conservation world, mm. which is often um, thought about as maybe the finer arts or the decorative arts or the softer side of cultural heritage. But in fact, mechanical engineering and engineering uh, in the wider sense uh, has a strong foothold uh, in the conservation world. But by adopting the terms and putting the two together, conservation engineer adds a little bit more weight and a bit more credibility uh, in in the modern sense today. Um, So we're competing with many other disciplines in conservation and conservation can mean many things to many people i remember in the very early days conservation was always maybe thought about in a sort of environmental context or wildlife or that type of thing uh whereas actually conservation in a sort of global term just really means if you like preserving or looking after our our heritage yeah on many different levels and this is sort of sort of the life i lead if you like and when you think about the the finer side of conservation, so when the sort of when the major museums and institutions were sort of coming into their own in the sort of eighteen fifties, eighteen sixties, the the sort of the public um, were were very new to Egyptology or mummies and tombs and things, and that was all incredibly exciting, yeah. and even was up into the nineteen seventies with Tutankhamun. But the museums, like the Science Museum in London. Um, the bastion of sort of science museums, if you like, uh, the, the spiritual home of industrial heritage. Um, they were already collecting steam engines and prime movers in a very, very early time and put them on display. So industrial heritage and conservation engineering has been around for many, many, many years, 150 years and more, but has never found a comfortable place uh, in the wider context of conservation. And, and this is something that I've been striving for for many, many years to try and uh, reposition engineering and conservation together uh, and bring it to a wider audience and a wider acceptance. So I guess coming back to your original question, conservation engineer is a new term. And I guess yeah. it's actually a new discipline, if you like, although it's been there rumbling around for many, many, many years. It's never found a, it's never found a comfortable home. And this is where... All aspects of, of the work I do, in fact, and indeed some of the work we do with IMEC-E internally, it, it's a way of showcasing mechanical engineering in a conservation context and a cultural heritage context. And sort of, we're not even trying to, uh, we're not trying to strengthen the position, we're just trying to uh, raise awareness. Uh, I think it's an acceptance, again, that mechanical engineering is it's bold, it's big, it's huge, it's robust, and People think it will be around forever, whereas <laughs> whereas smaller things, more decorative things, uh, they can perish quite quickly in harsh environments. A steam engine or a bridge could live outside for hundreds of years, and it will become rusty, and eventually it would it would uh, it will corrode. And that's why I think people are maybe a bit more relaxed about industrial heritage. But I can assure you, the risks are as significant as the finer and decorative arts side of conservation. So, I mean, conserving. Uh, industrial heritage is so important, not not just for engineers, but for, for all of society. I think in a way, the public or, or society is far more accepting of industrial heritage because it, I think it's obvious. I think it's been around for so long. And people, even if you weren't brought up with steam, there are many good steam books or steam film, or rather films or books that contain steam engines uh, in a sort of comical way or a more friendly way or child-friendly way. Yeah. So younger generations are still enjoying steam, although maybe they're doing it intuitively, not uh, in, a, in, a, in any other fashion. So it's always there. It's always in our life. But there are certain objects, certain artifacts um, that will get away if they're not saved. Mm. And we do have lots of objects that are already conserved and on display and, and exhibited in ma- major museums all around the world. But we still have to fight very hard to build on the work done by our predecessors in the Victorian and Edwardian times, where I think maybe the love of engineering was far more prominent. 
Yeah. It, it had a it had a, a bigger profile in society. If you were an engineer, you were really were a very important person in society, and you were rewarded so. Uh, and of course, it was a time of innovation. It was a time of the industrial revolution, and people were looking towards engineers to to make changes in life, to make life better. But maybe now we see engineering in a far different way. Uh, maybe it's just faster. Maybe it's cleaner. Maybe it's something that people maybe forget where engineering roots came from and have moved very quickly towards engineering as, it, as, it's, as it's performed today. But there's still a place uh, and there's still very much a place for conservation engineers in society and to contribute to our, the conservation of our, um, our cultural heritage. Yeah, I think you're right with with what you just said at the end there, Ian, that the the nature of engineering, it's become so accepted that technology is just there and we we accept it that, you know, back in the in those early Victorian days where that technology was really radically new, there was a there was a different perspective to it, wasn't there? And now we we need to communicate, I suppose, to society how valuable those examples of um industry and and art and so on are and how they need to be protected and conserved um, for, for future generations to appreciate them. I mean, when you think how, how fast engineering or how fast engineering innovation happened um, in the space of, you know, very few years, um, we moved from a very low base, very low technology to where we are now, sort of 150 years later, where we are highly mechanised and uh, a connected society. And it's, and it's all centred around engineering, which people sometimes maybe forget. I mean, an iPhone or other brands are available, of course. Um, a mobile phone um, is engineered. Yeah. It's technology. <laughs> it might be a device for all sorts of media and all sorts of entertainment, but primarily it's an engineering device. Yeah. Uh, and, and engineers make them and design them. True. <laughs> and repair them. Yeah. So yeah, we've come a long, long way uh, and um, we should never forget where we've come from uh, and where we are today because they both have an influence on each other. Yeah, absolutely. Now, your journey into uh, this field has been quite a family affair, hasn't it, Ian? It was your father's engineering journey that got you started in this, wasn't it? It, it was indeed. Uh, in fact, I come from a very long lineage of um well, a mixture really of uh, engineers, construction and seafaring. Right. And in fact, that's really encapsulated what I do as well, because they are the three areas areas that I sort of move and operate in. So mechanical engineering, uh, architectural and uh, maritime. Right. Yeah. So my my father was a rose to become chief engineer uh, for the Royal Mail Line uh, in the Merchant Navy. And my grandfather was on paddle steamers all his life and before that as well. And then my great grandfathers and, and before that, they were barge captains and barge owners. And they were moving goods up and down local coastal waters and up riverways through through Sussex and Kent. And quite interesting, actually, the other day we just realised that I had one side of the family who was a master bricklayer and he was building the Balkan viaduct on the London Brighton railway line. Okay. And my other grandfather at the time was um, barging bricks up from New Haven Harbour up the Sussex Ooze to Balkan, so my other grandfather could um, lay bricks, which I thought was kind of cool. Nice connection. <laughs> but yeah, so when my father, when my father left the navy, he became uh, what was generically known there as an engineering surveyor. So he was working for um, an insurance company, and his primary job really was. Uh, inspection of pressure, pressure vessels so he was a border inspector if you like and he was looking at any, everything from sort of um, air compressors and into the latter days uh, nuclear power stations and everything in between so as a very young boy um saturday for me was going to work and we were we we're going to sort of steel mills or going to collieries or textile mills and we were crawling through lancashire boilers and economizers and all sorts of stuff and seeing steam engines and so i guess for me it was sort of already in my DNA, yeah. but it certainly ignited my my passion for engineering. And, and although I didn't know it at the time, I think probably the, the, the pull was much bigger, much greater than I had actually thought about when I was, was a teenager. Um, my first ride on, the, on a steamroller was in, in the very early 60s. And luckily enough, uh, I, had a, I had a fantastic break because in the sort of early 70s, many, many steam-orientated projects were starting 
and these these were sort of the, the 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 preservation of large pumping stations and 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 indeed steam engines right across the country. It was sort of that was the pioneer movement, late fifties into the early sixties. Everybody was moving towards uh, preserve railways or preserve ships or preserve planes. And it goes back to what we were talking about earlier on. I mean, people just love. They didn't want to. They didn't want that era of engineering to disappear. They had a passion yeah. for it, and they wanted to preserve it. And and I was lucky to be on the coattails of that. And um, uh, a gentleman called Dr. Jonathan Mins, who became my life mentor, and only lost him a few years ago. Um, he was a pioneering industrial museum professional, along with the likes with Sir Neil Cousins and Frank Atkinson, who started in, in Bristol and. Uh, he started, um, he was the driving force behind Beamish Museum and, of course, Sunil Cousins right. went, went on to become the director of the Science Museum and indeed went on to be director general of the of um, English Heritage. So there was a great time uh, to come into the sector because, in a way, I guess it was moving from more a enthusiast uh, status into a far more accepted professional status. And that yeah. that transition wasn't planned it wasn't comfortable um, because these guys were fighting for their life to save industrial heritage. But this, so my mentor, Dr. Jonathan Mins, um, he took on to become custodian of a very large Victorian pumping station, which had beam engines and all sorts of wonderful things. And he put together a group of like-minded chaps who love steam, and they all worked together to restore this pumping station. And it, and it became a, it opened as a, a museum, as, a, as an attraction, cultural attraction. Um, but in the process of restoring the pumping station, they had an on-site workshop that was steam-driven. In fact, the steam engine in the workshop came second-hand from the Great Exhibition in 1851, so that was kind wow. of cool as well. So, yeah. in fact, even during during the during the uh, the coal strikes uh, in the early 80s, we were still able to operate because we would just take the belt off the electromotor, go back onto the steam engine, fire up the Lancashire boiler. And I remember, uh, as an apprentice, because I was then working there, which was fantastic, uh, I remember machining a prop shaft for a, a ship that came into Shoreham Harbour with a broken prop shaft, and we were making this brand-new prop shaft. I was working with, with candles. Um, we didn't have – there was no, uh, there was no um, sophisticated measuring equipment, but we were just working through the day, through the night, on steam power with candles, still producing goods, which is kind of nice. So the workshop was a um, – became uh, a commercial company, a limited company. We were doing restoration work, conservation work for clients all over the world in the end, uh, and I had a fantastic and unbelievable apprenticeship there. It was unusual – um, unique, it'll probably never ever happen again. Those that, that sort of opportunity will never come again. That's something we may touch on later. But I I was working with the most amazing people uh, from a different era, <laughs> um, but their knowledge knowledge of mechanical engineering was incredible. Uh, talk about think on your feet. You had to uh, with machine tools that dated back to the 1850s, 1860s. Uh, really amazing. And that was a that was a dilemma for me because I actually when I went when I finally went to college. Uh, technical college to study mechanical engineering I was always at odds with um, with machine tools because <laughs> um, I my my apprenticeship sort of started at, at the end of NC uh, machining and went into CNC as we know it today computerized medical control yeah and and for me to have a machine tool with no handles uh, just a computer was something very very <laughs> Well, that, just that, buttons to press. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we're, we're, having, we're having to write the program as well, which was coding, yeah. something that was brand new to everybody at that time. In, in fact, you know, I think probably CNC uh, as a concept in, in manufacturing probably is one of the biggest step change in engineering the world has ever, ever seen. It's, it's quite amazing how it's um, revolutionised manufacturing. But there I am sort of working on these Victorian machine tools and going to college and then driving the very first generation of CNC machines. It was a fantastic juxtaposition between my working day and my and my college life. But anyway, we, that was a fantastic sort of uh, period of my life. And um, I left that particular museum in 1983 and pursued a, a freelance career and set my business up in the same year and um, following on, I guess. And it's, it's been a fantastic, wonderful journey. It, it sounds like a, a, any engineer's dream. I mean, I, I, at the age of seven, I wanted to build a power station. That's that's <laughs> what I wanted to do. So, so to have followed in your footsteps and done that would have just been a dream for me. It would have been amazing. I, I'm very envious <laughs> of your of your path into our wonderful profession. It sounds an incredible journey. I mean, I mean, the the, the amazing thing about that particular workshop and working with those with those 
gentlemen who who ranged in age from their 80s down to me as a sort of 17, 18 year old. And I look back now, and I'm not sure whether it was designed this way, but we we covered every discipline and every task. Nothing was put out. And when I think about how my company works now, and we we work with lots and lots of specialist contractors, subcontractors who, who provide us with specialist skills and specialist resource. During those early days, we didn't put anything out. If, they, if we didn't have a machine that was uh, right for the job, we would adapt it. I remember once working on my bench, and we built our own benches. I remember working on my bench, which was I was very proud of. And then the, the, the foreman came along and said, do you mind, I'm just going to bolt a top slide to your bench because we need to extend the lathe across the length of the workshop. So suddenly now I've got a top slide on my bench and a, a man operating 25 feet away. <laughs> but that's what happened. And, and, yeah. we, and, and, we, and we, we, you know, we, we made things out of timber and lots of tallow and all sorts of stuff. And it, it was just incredible, incredible experience. But, you know, we had a fully operational forge. We had a drawing office. We had pattern makers. We had coach painters. We were doing lining. We were doing decorative stuff like that. Um, full machine shop, welding, riveting. It, we, we covered every single base. And I didn't question it. Yeah. I didn't question that, uh, oh, uh, we can't do that because we just did it. And I remember one amazing, I'll just tell this quick story, one amazing a sort of enlightening moment for me because it's something I did much later when I first started my business. But I remember we were making a, we were making a firebox uh, for a locomotive boiler, starting with a piece of half-inch plate um, cut, to, cut to size, and we had to bend it into a shape. Right. And so we all gathered outside the yard in the sort of fire pit, as it were. And we had this piece of plate and it was welded down to another piece of plate on the floor, a foot plate. And then then me and along with two other people, we had these massive, great um, plate nozzles on, on oxy, oxyacetylene. And, and we were we were heating the plate as two other men, two other engineers were forming it around a, an armature we'd made to bend this shape. And it took three quarters of a day. Yeah. And it was it was beautifully done. It was perfectly done, and I didn't question: would there be an easier way of doing it? I don't know. <laughs> it's just what we did. That's what was available in the workshop. Yeah. And then rolling forward a couple of years, I started my business. I, I had to make a similar plate for a similar application. Uh, and this would have been sort of uh, yeah early eighties. And I went to a, uh, to see a, a friend of mine who worked at a, in a factory, and they had a big brake press. And uh, we put the piece of plate in there and we bent it to shape with two blows and it cost me a tenner. And I just thought, <laughs> I just thought wow. <laughs> and then suddenly your eyes are open to, uh, it is wonderful to, to innovate. It's wonderful to struggle in a very challenging way. But sometimes <laughs> there's somebody out there who's got the machine or got a skill that um, can really help you out. <laughs> well, we, we forget sometimes as engineers, don't we, that, that actually we're making the technology to help us make the technology and uh, yeah you come across a piece of technology to help you and save time and be efficient and it can make the world of difference to to the things that we make and that's yeah. how we as engineers innovate and it's it's incredible to hear that story from you i also think i mean thinking back to those days i, I also have an opinion that we kind of all enjoyed the challenge of not being able to do something, yeah. come up with a solution. And, and having come up with a solution, you're then part of the process. So you've actually made this with your hands as opposed to a machine just doing it in 30 seconds, which is brilliant, but maybe not so absorbing or not so enjoyable. But yeah, yeah, true. It commercially, it certainly stacks up. Yeah, th there, is, there is something quite uh, joyful about the uh, overcoming the challenge, isn't there? Mm -hmm. I think that's what drives us all as engineers. Having worked in this field for over 40 years, and you've obviously learned as much from your formal engineering education as you, you have from, quite rightly, your hands-on experience as you've just been talking about. But conservation engineering is not a qualification that I've heard of. So how does a young engineer or even someone looking to move into this field get into it and, and go about, you know, getting involved? Um, brilliant question and a significant challenge and one that really needs addressing quite urgently. This is, some, this is an area that's very, uh, very, uh, I'm very passionate about and very concerned about. Yes, you're quite right. 
uh, you haven't heard of it and um, you're in the engineering community and there are probably many engineers out there listening who also haven't heard about um, conservation engineering. And as I alluded to earlier on, it, it is a fairly new term that hasn't really been, well, it hasn't been adopted officially at all. Getting a, a conservation engineering qualification, currently, that's not possible. It doesn't exist. Right. And there, therein lies the, the bigger question, the bigger challenge. So if we just quickly, broadly look at the wider conservation community uh, and all those interconnected disciplines uh, that lay within, um, if you were coming from, let's just say for argument's sake, an art background or say from an archaeology background, which you have read at university, and that's where your passion lays, and you want to break into um, museum or conservation, uh, let's leave it loosely in those terms. There are many, many, many accredited courses around the country and, in fact, across the globe where you can apply um, for an additional degree or additional qualification specifically in that discipline. So if you want to go and maybe learn about uh, textile conservation, there are areas, there are courses that you can apply to. If you want to go to paper conservation, you can do that. Decorative fine arts, they're all pretty well covered. Mm. There are some courses that will look at conservation in, in very broad terms and give you a very broad understanding of what um, the challenges uh, are. And they will touch on metalwork. They'll touch on things like silver smithing. They'll, they'll, they'll maybe look at sword making, maybe look at uh, blacksmithing, maybe look at horology. Right. Uh, so metal in, in that context. So it's metals in fine art form or in smaller forms. If you want to look at, if you're maybe uh, an engineer that's just qualified and are very passionate about moving into conservation or into cultural heritage, the world I live in, um, there are no opportunities whatsoever, and that's the depressing fact. Wow. And um, why yeah. that is, I've been I've been searching and searching all my career because this is the conversation I was having forty five years ago okay. as a, as an apprentice, and I was I was absolutely amazed that no one is addressing this. And it's something that, as a society, we either embrace or we if we uh, decide that there's no appetite, no need to train what is essentially going to be a specific discipline, a conservation engineer. So an engineer to move into conservation, if we decide that's not something we want to do, then that's a decision society will make. Mm. And that's a discussion and debate I've been having for many, many years and very much so in the last 10, 15 years, 20 years. Uh, and we've touched on this with I within IMECI and um, the work we do, which I think we're going to talk about later on, the IMECI Heritage Committee. There is an awareness. There is an awareness that there are fewer and fewer people that are able to undertake what is required of the future for conservation engineering or industrial heritage. If you, if we think back to its origins, so this, this think back to again the mid fifties, uh, late fifties, early sixties, when you had predominantly men, uh, ably supported by their partners and wives, they were doing a daytime job which might involve manufacturing, engineering, could be railways, could be all sorts of things. But collectively, they all had a love and a passion for engineering as it was, certainly in transport, was, was moving a foot very fast, uh, moving towards uh, other types of motive power. So these people decided we want to save our railway, we want to save uh, our tram, we want to save our bus, whatever it is. And they got together as groups of enthusiasts to save this type of uh, cultural heritage industrial heritage and it was done mostly by enthusiasts and by default or or for whatever reason the love of these preserved sites uh, grew and grew and grew and, and became part of the fabric of this society uh, and it is still today mm. but the the pioneers the, the 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 people who drove that dream drove that uh, vision are now coming to an end of their working life and some have passed and some aren't retired and finding it hard to have the same energy and same input as they did 20, 30, 40 years ago. So we cannot, as we have been doing for the last 50, 60 years, we cannot to continue to expect that generation to underpin the future of industrial heritage yeah. and, and conservation. It's not going to happen. There are certain, certain sectors like the railways 
who are so good and so proactive of training uh, future generations. And in fact, some heritage lottery funded bursaries have been given to people such as the Blue Bell Railway. So they can extend their training opportunities, which is, you know, it's it's a fantastic thing to see. Yeah. But we need this. We need it to be rolled out on a, on a far wider uh, scale, and we need to roll it into areas that so far we have neglected to do so. Because the the the, the industrial heritage sector is quite fragmented. So this is not without. This is this. I'm not. This is not a um, a criticism. It's an observation. The railways, the preserved railways, are very, very good at looking after themselves. Yeah. And why, and why wouldn't they? People working with aircraft, people working with ships, people working with motorbikes, trams, buses, they all are good at looking after themselves and they do a grand, fantastic job. But all those, all, those dis- diff- all those different disciplines and sectors need to be brought together because collectively a stronger voice. Mm-hmm. Um, we need to drive this message through. But... So going back to your original question, I don't think there's, I don't think we need to inspire the next generation. I think we need to help the next generation. We need to create learning opportunities for the next generation. That's where we're lacking at the moment. I mean, as I explained earlier, my opportunity will never ever come again. It was, it was a, it was, it's a distant past, and it was just, I happened to be in the right place at the right time, and at that time, you could. Uh, like I did, you could find an opportunity there because they existed, and and they all those opportunities were dri- were being driven by people who were really passionate about what we're talking about through this interview. Um, those people still around, people with passion like myself and, and other like minded people like yourself. Yeah. <laughs> there, there is a there is a there is a an enthusiasm, a passion for industrial heritage, but what we don't have at this moment in time is any codified opportunities for learning any accredited uh, courses for learning and that's something that um i think we should mm. collectively drive drive towards together to try and sort out a solution i mean I'm, I'm a great believer that this is in support of engineers i think i could personally take an engineer of any standing and enthuse them uh, and train them to become a good industrial conservator or conservation engineer I think it would be really difficult to take, let's say, a, a well-rounded, well-trained conservator and teach them to be an engineer. Yeah. Because I think you have to be an engineer first to be an engineering conservator or conservation engineer. And if I give you a, ve- give you a very, very quick example, um, something that I've always thought about for many, many years, uh, I've often given talks where I, I would give a situation where um, if I walk into, a, um, into an art gallery and I see a professional conservator cleaning, restoring uh, a painting, an easel painting, and I engage in conversation and sort of ask what they're doing, and they're explaining that they're um, carrying out some cleaning works, investigation works, some retouching works, whatever that work might be. And I sort of say, well, um, can you explain to me a, a little bit about what you're doing and a little bit about your background? And, and if they start to explain to me about their background and their love of art and this particular artist or this particular um, period, they can tell me maybe about how the picture was painted, what time of year it was painted, what time of day it was painted, uh, the pigments, all that sort of stuff, even down to the design of the frame. And they come back and they tell me all that. I would be really impressed and also actually very happy that someone of that experience and passion uh, is responsible for conserving, looking after, preserving art heritage. I would expect the same from from an, uh, from a, a conservation engineer. If you're looking after an industrial collection or you're working on an industrial collection, and that can be of any type of engineering, I strongly believe that that person should be trained in conservation because there are ethical considerations to be had, and that's another whole podcast which we won't go into. <laughs> um, um, but there are ethical considerations. There are softer sides of conservation that uh, you would have to learn about. The responsibilities of being a credited conservator are, are many fold. But you'd also need to be, I think, have a good a good grounding in engineering, a good understanding of, of engineering. You'd have to understand metallurgy at its basic levels. You understand about material science and all that stuff into the mix. Mm. And that blend would make, would produce uh, a, a the future of conservation engineering, those opportunities don't exist. Uh, And that's something that uh, I find frightening as I come towards possibly the last part of my career. 
uh, is how we can maybe address that. It's, it's a huge challenge. I'm a key have embraced this challenge through the work we do uh, in the Engineering Heritage Committee. Uh, we raise awareness, uh, and I know maybe we talk. We will talk about Heritage, Heritage Awards. Yeah. Um, so there's there's much to do. There's much work to do, Helen. Um, I am pessimistic at the moment because nothing has changed in the 50 years I've been around it, mm. and I don't see how it's going to change. But as I said earlier on, collectively as a society, we have to make that decision. And it's something we either believe in or don't believe in because it won't be very long. I wrote an article in 1989 talking about the demise, the loss of traditional skills, heritage craft based skills, which you are, which you need to look after uh, industrial heritage. From 1989 to now, nothing has changed. Mm. It's only got worse. And there are fewer, fewer people doing this type of work. There are many people doing fantastic work in all, all areas of industrial heritage, but even for them, uh, say so even for them, for them collectively, there's nowhere where they can go and codify their knowledge and skills and accreditation and come out with a qualification. So to answer your question, Helen, you haven't heard of it because it doesn't exist. Yeah. It only exists in our it only exists in our operation and what we do, it doesn't exist as a as a, a qualification and that's something that has to change. Yeah, that it that's t- makes me feel very sad actually in some respects that society is re- reliant on us in performing this particular task and yet there is no uh, driver to create more people, more engineers to do this task. I, I, I hope maybe there are people internationally listening to to our show today that that are we'll pick up on that and hopefully we will get some feedback from from our listeners but i i would encourage any uh, academics who are in in this kind of field to um to really push uh, for this uh, qualification, these kind of uh, recognized uh, standards uh, for this this kind of work because it is so vitally important certainly to me i i, I love i grew up visiting at Kreitz Tramway Museum, you know, and being taken to airports with by my dad to just point and look at planes, yeah. and and all of these things like the Vulcan bomber, for example, um, absolutely are all vitally important to to our heritage and culture, and and we need those engineers to be able to preserve them. So I'm right behind you, Ian. With uh, I, I will carry a flag for you. <laughs> can, I, can I just add, uh, Helen? This is not a UK challenge. This is a global challenge. Yes, yes, indeed. To make that point, uh, IMEC has got huge reach. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah, it's, it's a global problem, and I, I don't understand why it's become a global problem. I really don't. Mm. Uh, and it's, it's a massive challenge. But why can't, why can't we here in the UK, why can't we be the pioneers, why can't we be the flag bearers for what could become a, a brand new, really uh, exciting, modern approach to engineering but but also um looking after a cultural heritage it, it could be a fantastic opportunity for a whole group of people yeah and i i'm gonna i am gonna name a few i mean we do i may key could very happily and we have we have we have been proactive about this um we would join together with with the with the big stakeholders english heritage historic england national trust and the government you know um much has been said in the government, but we're still at a, a stalemate. So something has to change. Yeah. Well, let's keep our fingers crossed for that. Mm. Now, I think most people who are listening to this show, and you've alluded to it a little bit, but most people will assume that conservation is purely about buildings and architecture. That's kind of what we assume when it comes to kind of yeah. big structures. But but you are involved in, in far more than that, aren't you? You've conserved everything from ships to decorative art and even models. And in fact... You, you've been responsible for the restoration of several of the models in the I'm a Keys collection. So how do you go about applying your vast engineering knowledge and skills to these incredibly different objects? Really? Um, when you look at what I deal with and what we work with as a, as, a, as a company, so we work in three main areas, so mechanical engineering, and that's huge, through to architectural, through to maritime most uh, uh, most things we work on are metals. Yeah. Most things we work on have been manufactured or produced. 
not everything we work on dates from 1850. Some of it dates from a couple of months ago. <laughs> um, and there, there lies in another problem. So, but my, or another challenge, I just say, we don't have problems, we have challenges. So when I think back to my, my, my basic core understanding of engineering must be a bit like doing your basic training in the military. It sets the foundations to further your career, to become a better person, to become a better example of yourself in your chosen career. So sometimes I kick myself because I am given the responsibility to work on things that are iconic. They are the last remaining. They are the most important, made by the most important engineer, owned by the most important person. They're the biggest, they're the smallest. From nanotechnology, I've worked on, I worked on the oldest Christmas pudding given in the military, surviving. It happened to be in a metal tin. It's on display at the National Museum of the Royal Navy. Uh, it's the oldest Christmas pudding in existence. I didn't conserve the pudding, but I certainly conserved the tin that it sits in. So it, it's from the sublime to ridiculous to, 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 to World War II submarines, to World War I submarines, to right. aerospace, uh, as you say, decorative art, architecture, all sorts of stuff. The, the challenges are pretty similar, whereby there's a physical problem which requires a physical solution. And as engineers, we're, we are, we're programmed to find solutions. We're programmed to think outside the box. I don't like the term, but we're, we're, we, we, we are trained to, to be innovative and to, to find solutions that maybe aren't there. And I think, for me personally, I can't speak for other conservatives working in other disciplines, but I think when I'm, when I'm working with a, an industrial artifact, an object, it's my understanding, it's my, it's my, um, uh, it's my empathy with the subject, empathy with the object that gets me through. I, I connect, I, I, I have a connection with the object, whether it be a steam engine, a bridge, a submarine, a rivet, a bolt, whatever it is. Uh, <laughs> for me, it's familiar. It has its place. It, it's, it fits in the bigger picture of engineering and things are put together. Things are engineered. They're held together with all sorts of methods. They all work in different ways, but similar, all, the, all sort of very similar. The principles underpin what we do. Yeah. So as an engineer, I'm comfortable applying my trade in conservation. Uh, and that's where we need to get to with the next generation we talked about uh, just now. So, yes, I think all of us as engineers, you may have learned something 30, 40, 50 years ago. You might have learned something three weeks ago. It holds you in good stead. So if I'm working on a Henry Moore sculpture, it was it was cast in a foundry. Yeah. We understand founding techniques. I mean, I've learned I've learned in the last couple of years, I mean, uh, pattern making, foundry techniques have changed out of all recognition. Uh, 3D printing has changed <laughs> pattern making forever. Um, but And that's really exciting and in some ways very sad because we're now losing traditional pattern makers so quickly we're not training anymore. Mm. So that will become soon a traditional skill that's lost to the world forever. And that's incredibly sad, people that can produce loose patterns. Anyway, so I just think that my knowledge and my experience as a, as a as an engineer, uh, as a vocational engineer, I want to add vocational engineer because my my life, my 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 journey through engineering has been vocational. I've had to under I've had to underpin that with um, achievement, but my training, my life, my journey has been predominantly uh, a vocational, and I'm a great advocate for vocational training. That's why I'm so so proud to be one of the first engineering technician qualifications at. Uh, uh, recipients at IMECI, and I think I may have been the first fellow, which was for me incredible to think. I'm so so proud that I managed to achieve fellowship at IMECI, something I never yeah. thought I'd ever ever ever, ever achieve. So I'm very proud about that. So the, the whole journey for me um, is all underpinned by my basic understanding, core principles uh, written in in mechanical engineering, and it gives me the confidence to to undertake what I do. Uh, and you're always learning. Uh, every every engineer I know, every person I know is learning every day. Uh, things change, how we relate to objects, how we interpret objects, how we display objects. It changes. Uh, changing generations, want to, uh, new generations, future de- generations want to want to view objects in different ways. They their their brains uh, wired differently. They see things differently. Uh, and we have to move with the times. And we have to make it not as appealing, more appealing. 
we have to keep uh, we have to keep inspiring young people um, through engineering to become engineers. Yeah, because um, that's the future. On, on all levels of engineering, not not just conservation engineering. I, I think you're right. I think our un, the underpinning theories of what engineering is about. We we all learn those. That's that's the nature of what we do as a profession. But but it's it's how we then take that underpinning and apply it, isn't it? And and in your case whether it's a ship whether it's it's a, a a very small model that the the underpinning engineering principles are the same and and we we draw on our knowledge or or, or experiences or things like that to help us then get through dealing with that specific object um but it but it's the nature of who we are as engineers i think that underpins w- uh, what we do i mean one of the one of the biggest challenges helen it, is over and over and above over and above finding and aspiring and giving opportunities to the next generation of conservation engineers. That's challenging enough. But predominantly in my working life day to day, whether it be working on a steam locomotive in the Middle East, or whether it be working on a textile mill, um, whether it be working on a, on, on bronze sculpture, I'm working with materials and material science that's well known. And it's well documented, well referenced, uh, and I can I can draw on a huge database over and above my own experience. The f- future conservation engineers will be dealing with materials that I don't have a great handle over at the moment because um, I'm not in a position to to uh, work with them closely. So I'm thinking about all the plastics, all the engineering plastics, the graphenes, uh, the Kevlar's. And um, very complicated metal alloys that I've maybe used in aerospace or aerospace uh, sectors and and in nuclear power generation and and telecoms. These are emerging materials and these emerging materials uh, will become the future objects that require conservation if if a society that's what we're going to continue to do. So the future engineers who will grow up with these emerging materials will develop emerging skills, which they will bolt on to their existing core skills, which I've had to do. But for me, I predominantly work with traditional materials, um, which is kind of uh, makes life a little bit easier <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> because we understand what we're doing. We understand not only what materials are made of and, and how they react in certain environmental conditions, we know what they might do over a given time. If we're looking at a piece of cast iron, a piece of wrought iron from – you know, the 1850s or even earlier, 1770s, 1780s, we know how it's going to behave because we keep digging it up still. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, the Staffordshire Horde, uh, it's, it's wonderful, ornate, and it's decorative metals, but it's, you know, it's Anglo-Saxon. But we know the core materials, coppers, bronze, you know, copper alloys, and we know how they can react in the ground. But how we, we're going to have to build that database, that knowledge, continuing knowledge for emerging materials and apply that to conservation, which will be in itself a really exciting challenge. I mean, at the moment, we have lots of great people now working with plastics because in the 1950s, 1960s, there was a great move towards um, plastic furniture, plastic jewellery. Um, so people working in, in that that area, that discipline of conservation, they are having to learn about how plastics degrade, UV degradation and, and the such like. So, you know... It, the world of conservation, conservation science, conservation in the wider aspect, it's really fascinating. And it's, it's a subject that engineers could immerse themselves in and get really quite excited about, given the opportunity. You've been listening to Impulse to Innovation, the Institution of Mechanical Engineers podcast. Thanks for listening. We'd love to hear from you, so if you'd like to share any news or any feedback with us, then please email us, podcast at imeke.org. All the information on this episode can be found in the episode notes.